the schoolyard, where years of crushing insecurity blossom from being picked last for kickball. Reminds me of a simpler time. Well, I'm happy to see that recess is an intergalactic tradition. In this sketch, we're going to be joining some young space dinosaurs to learn about monohybrid crosses and Punnett squares. Okay, let's get to it. In a monohybrid cross, only one gene is considered. There's a single flower on this jump rope to represent the single gene that is examined in a monohybrid cross. You could say that these dinos are jumping single Dutch. Is that a thing? Sounds like a Netherlandish dating app. Hmm. Let's take a look at the blacktop while you ponder that. Punnett squares are a useful tool to solve genetic problems. Namely, they can predict the outcome of a monohybrid cross. When parental genotypes at a locus are known, Punnett squares can be used to predict the proportion of offspring that will have a given phenotype or genotype. Two by two grids are used for monohybrid crosses, which, whoa, crazy, is just like a game of four square. It's almost like we planned this. The columns of a Punnett square represent the alleles in one parent's gametes, while the rows represent the other parent. Here, maternal gametes, represented by the egg-shaped balls, are going to be in the rows. The sperm balls represent the paternal gametes, which are going to take up the columns of this four-square court. You might remember that for an autosomal gene, each parent will carry two alleles that can be the same or different. One is on each homologous chromosome. You might also remember that during meiosis, homologous chromosome pairs are separated into haploid cells called gametes. This means that half of parents' gametes will carry the allele they have on one homolog, while the other half of their gametes will carry the allele on the other homolog. And that's why each parent needs two gamete balls, and why a Punnett square needs two columns and two rows. When setting up a Punnett square, different autosomal alleles at the same locus or gene are usually represented by the same letter. To make things simple, we're going to use the letter A. A dominant allele is always represented by an uppercase letter, or, in this case, a red ball. And, as you may have guessed, that means that a recessive allele is always represented by a lowercase letter, or a white ball. Okay, now that we've got our Punnett four-square court all set up, let's get some action on this blacktop. The boxes inside a Punnett square represent the possible genotypes of the zygotes that form when the paternal gametes meet during fertilization, and thus, the genotypes of the parent's offspring. These four sporting young dinos represent offspring. To fill in these boxes, follow a maternal and a paternal gamete across the square until they meet. Then, record both parental alleles. Ta-da! You've got the genotype of one diploid zygote. You can see that in the upper left box, where the dominant red egg ball and the dominant red sperm ball meet, there's a young dino wearing two red socks with uppercase A's on them. That's her genotype, because she inherited a dominant allele from both parents. And this pattern continues. The kids in the boxes where a dominant red ball and a recessive white ball meet have one uppercase red sock and one lowercase white sock to show us that they are heterozygous. And finally, where the two recessive white gamete balls meet, we've got a homozygous recessive fella wearing two lowercase white socks. Aw, don't cry, little dude. White socks are totally going to be in next season. Once all four boxes are filled out, every possible combination of offspring genotypes from that cross will be determined, as well as the relative frequency of each genotype. So far, we focus on the genotypes of offspring, but sometimes you might be interested in phenotype rather than genotype. When considering monohybrid crosses, you often encounter crosses between two heterozygotes, like the one we just saw. In these crosses, the expected ratio of phenotypes should be roughly three offspring with dominant phenotypes to every one offspring with a recessive phenotype. You'll notice that our four square players are holding balls that represent their phenotype. We've got three dominant dinos holding red balls and one lonely recessive dino with a white ball. You know what they say. It's all fun and games until the homozygous recessive dino starts crying. You might have noticed that I said we expect roughly this distribution of phenotypes. The 3 to 1 ratio is an approximation because this is the outcome that probability predicts. But which gametes actually end up meeting to create a zygote is random. However, the more offspring a pair produces, the closer their offspring's phenotypes should come to this prediction. Okay, let's get back to the adult supervision, or lack thereof. Generation P, or the parental generation, is the first generation examined in a cross. To represent the parental generation, these parents, who provided those top-notch gamete balls, are watching proudly as their offspring play. 
Seems like maybe they should have a chat with a few of these kiddos after the game, but hey, I'm not here to tell them how to raise their kids. The F1 generation consists of the offspring of the parental cross, which would be our young Foursquare players. To remind us that these offspring represent the F1 generation, we've labeled this court Foursquare 1. So you know, F1 stands for filial 1, and filial means relating to offspring. Ah, it's all coming together, isn't it? Now, when two heterozygous F1 individuals are crossed, the resulting generation is called F2, which is why this court is labeled four square two. These dinos are a bit young to have their own kids, but in the meantime, they have dolls to represent their offspring. Who knows what other earthly games they play with these humans, but hopefully, they skip the one where they file taxes and argue over what's for dinner. Next, these dino pals are comparing their test results to represent test crosses. Test crosses are used to determine if an individual with a dominant phenotype is heterozygous or homozygous dominant. Because an individual with a recessive phenotype is sure to be homozygous recessive, crossing them with an individual with an unknown genotype can solve this genotype mystery. With our dinos here, you can see one student got a clear grade of little a, little a, but her buddy on the left got a very vague big A question mark. Now, I don't claim to know how alien dinosaur grades work, but it seems like this school needs to hire some more decisive teachers. Okay, back to test crosses. If offspring produced in a test cross all have dominant phenotypes, they must all be heterozygous, and thus the unknown parent's genotype must be homozygous dominant. If roughly half the offspring show dominant phenotypes and half are recessive, the parent must be heterozygous. So, simple as that. When there are only two alleles present for a gene in the population, you can figure out an unknown genotype with just one cross. Now, let's take a look at back crosses, which of course, happen at the backstop. Joke's on you if you thought baseball was America's pastime. Clearly, it's the Milky Way's pastime. Well, anyways, a back cross is a cross between an F1 individual and a member of the parent generation, which is why this parent and their offspring are getting in some batting practice together. Back crosses are typically used to make desirable parental traits more common in the next generation. This technique is often used in horticulture to ensure that desirable phenotypes are maintained in crops, or it can be used in scenarios like breeding a prize-winning racehorse with their offspring to ensure that those prize-winning parental traits remain in future generations. Inbreeding can be a concern in back crosses, so it must be done very carefully to ensure that offspring don't have decreased fitness. All right. Well, this has been nostalgic and all, but I'm wearing white socks, so let's take one last look around and get out of here before I'm the one being pelted with gamete balls. In a monohybrid cross, only one gene is examined. Punnett squares are diagrams used to estimate the genotypes of offspring produced in a genetics cross. For a monohybrid cross, a 2x2 two two square is used. The letters on the outside of a Punnett square represent parental genotypes. Specifically, the rows represent the two possible genotypes of one parent's gametes, while the columns represent the two genotypes of the other parent's gametes. When writing genotypes, the dominant allele is represented by an uppercase letter, and the recessive allele is represented by the same letter in lowercase. The letters inside the boxes of a Punnett square represent every possible genotype for the offspring produced in that cross. If a parent has many offspring, they should have about the same ratio of offspring genotypes as the ratio shown inside the Punnett square. The first generation to be crossed is called the parental generation, or P generation. The F1 generation are the offspring of a parental cross. An F2 cross occurs when the offspring produced in an F1 cross are mated. A test cross is used to determine the genotype of an individual who displays a dominant phenotype. The individual with the unknown phenotype is crossed with an individual who is homozygous recessive for that gene. By examining the phenotypes of their offspring, the parental genotype can be inferred. And finally, in back crosses, members of the F1 generation are crossed with members of the P generation to preserve desired parental traits. Well, this has been a nice walk down memory lane, but it's time to get back to my adult responsibilities. Yep. <sighs> Filing taxes and arguing over what's for dinner. Not spaghetti again. Ugh. Oh.